It is my Sunday sit down chat. I've been starting to really look forward to these every week. Um, and this is a topic I am really excited about exploration in tabletop games. I'm not going to get into video games. I know video games do exploration in a ton of interesting ways. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to focus on tabletop games today because that's, that's what I know much better than, than uh, video games. Um, and this isn't like a top 10 list or anything like that. I'm just going to talk about it from a design perspective and then from a player perspective. And one of the reasons this is really on my mind is that one of the two games I've been designing for quite some time now is an open world exploration game. Um, I won't go into the details here about what it is uh, because I want that to be a surprise when the game is ready. But uh, it's, it's constantly on my mind, like what, what I can do to make this game um, as interesting and as fun and as, uh, as vast of, of an exploration game that I can. And so I've been thinking a lot about other exploration games. And so today I thought I, I'd explore different categories of exploration. Um, this will be a little bit more focused on game designers than I have uh, in, in other recent videos. Um, so let me start with, uh, so you'll kind of see how this works in a second when I get to it. So the first category is um, games with uh, ran exploration games with random assortments of tiles on the board. Uh, but, and you'll, you'll probably see throughout this video that there are plenty of examples of games that have random assortments of tiles on the board. Uh, but this is specifically for exploration, where you are discovering what's on those tiles. You don't know what's on those tiles at the beginning of the game. Um, and the two examples I have of this are Forbidden Desert, which is a game where you, you start with a five by five grid of tiles. Uh, they're all face down and uh, many of them are covered with sand and you are moving across the board to, uh, to discover what's on those tiles and, have, and it, there's a very specific spatial element with it because you're trying to discover parts of your crashed ship that are somewhere within that grid. And there are tiles that say, okay, it's somewhere in this column, and, the, and there's another tile that says somewhere in this row. And you need to find those tiles and then go to that, uh, that spot that they pinpointed and pick up the item on that tile. Um, there's also other things you can discover by flipping over the tiles. The other one that comes to mind, the one that I actually own, is Burger Brothers. Burger Brothers is a heist game at its heart, but it really is an exploration game because you have this similar thing. You have a grid of tiles that you're moving around. You're either looking at them from the tile, an adjacent tile, or you are moving on to them and flipping them right away. So uh, with Burger Brothers, this, there's this tension uh, between do I, do I look and see if it's a good thing or a bad thing in advance, or do I just use my limited actions to, to move on to it and, um, and see what's there? Uh, so yeah, this is one category. I think this is an interesting category of exploration games uh, because there's a lot of variability there. Um, you know, every time you set up, it's a random setup. And uh, with, with a very small number of tiles, you can have a ton of variability, which I think can be a very great thing in an exploration game. Uh, so that's first category. The second category, let's do... Um, tiles that you place as you explore throughout the game. So you start out with a, usually a very simple um, board, maybe a few hexes at most, a few tiles. And uh, as you play, as you move around the board, you randomly put out new tiles uh, to, to form the board. So you're constructing the board as you go. This is the element that's most associated with 4X games, although I will argue to the end of the world that it is not the only way a 4X game needs to implement exploration. Um, a few examples of games that do this are uh, Archipelago, which I contend has one of the most beautiful maps in, in, in board games. Uh, the, the hexes themselves are beautiful and they fit together in, in a way that feels so organic and just looks beautiful. I, I had to include a photo of it in the, uh, the primary image for this video because um, it just results in a beautiful, beautiful board. In Archipelago, one of the interesting twists in it is that when you, uh, you can always see, I think, two, uh, two sides of two hexes uh, when you are exploring. And I think you pick one of them. It's either one or two. Um, but you don't know what's on the backside, so you might end up picking a tile that, uh, that doesn't work, like the face of it just doesn't fit into the board as is. Um, but you can hope that maybe when you flip that tile over, that it has a face that does fix, fit with the configuration on the board, or the exact place that you want to place it. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. And it just, they just look beautiful. That's, that's the main thing about Archipelago. Uh, another one is Zia, or Zaya. Zaya, I think it's Zaya. I've only played Zaya once. Zaya very much has that, um, that 
random element of, of moving on to a new space. You don't know what's there. You put down a tile. I think it's somewhat infamous because there is like a sun tile, I think, that you can just move right into and just burn immediately. Um, but that can create some memorable moments too. So I, I like that Zaya has this element of um, like true uncertainty. Like you don't know what you're going to end up on when you move into an empty space on the board. Um, one that uh, two that have kind of twist on this are uh, escape and magic maze. Th these aren't hex tiles, but in escape and magic maze, they're both real time games where you are um, you're exploring very quickly. So it, it, they don't really feel like exploration games, but you are you're starting out on one tile and you're expanding very quickly to a bunch of different tiles and forming the board randomly as you go. Um, so it does result in an exploration game. The last is Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe is another one where you start out with, I believe, one hex on the board. In at least the scenario that I played, you start out with one hex. And then if you choose to explore, uh, you, can, you can add more hexes. And one thing that I, I want to point out about Robinson Crusoe, the art uh, direction here that I think is pretty cool, is that the tiles are, um, are side views. So you're not looking down from above like you do in most exploration games. You're looking at it from the side, which I think can uh, allow for... Um, I don't want to say more beautiful art, but more distinctive first-person art, maybe a little bit more memorable um, when, you, when you're seeing it as you would see it from your human eyes. You look at it, a mountain from the side instead of from above. So I think that's cool. All right, let's get into uh, the next category, which is... Um, okay, yeah, let's do this one. This is the category of... Uh, preset boards with random elements discovered as you move around the board. So an example of this, I'll start with one of mine, Scythe. Actually, I, do, I don't have the big box for Scythe, but I have a little box um, for Invaders from the Far. Uh, the big box is just too, too heavy to carry. Uh, so with Scythe, there are two elements of discovery and exploration in the game. So it's a preset map. You know it's out there. There's never any doubt, and this is important to the mechanisms of the game that you can't like move into a random space because there are rules sometimes regarding like river walk and things like that, regarding where you can actually move. But there are discovery elements through the encounter system. So you, you move your character onto a space with an encounter token, and you get to draw a card with, again, similar to Robinson, Cru Robinson Crusoe, a first-person view of what you're seeing, the situation that you're seeing, that you've stumbled into, and then you have a few options as to what you do in that scenario. So this is an, this is an element of discovering exploration inside. There's also the factory cards. When you get to the middle of the board and get to the factory with your character, you can... Uh, look through all the factory cards and walk away with a new piece of technology that you have discovered there at the factory. I would say there's a fine line between discovery and exploration in games, um, but uh, but I think I think Scythe walks that line well. Obviously, I designed it. Two other examples of this that that have their own unique twist on it are Clank. Clank, I actually do have back there on the shelf. Clank is a wonderful uh, deck building game where you are. Um, you're running through a dungeon, essentially, with, with your character as you're playing card through your deck that let you move. And it's, uh, so it's a preset board, but you randomize a bunch of the tokens on the board, these uh, face-down question mark tokens. They're big ones and they're little ones. And so as you run across the board, your character is picking up these tokens. Uh, so even though you know what the board looks like, there's no doubt there, and that lets you choose your paths and, and strategize as that element of strategy that you can actually see where you're going, um, you're still discovering and exploring specific random elements uh, throughout, the, throughout the board. The last example of this is this War of Mine, which does exploration in a couple different ways. One is um, similar to uh, Scythe and Clank. There are these, or more like Clank actually, there are random room tiles that you put on the board face down at the beginning of the, of the game because the board is kind of divided into the building that you've taken refuge in and uh, the I think it's the city area on the left that you can go to. And so in the house itself, in the building, are these random uh, room cards that you can walk into them and discover what they are. Hopefully get some good stuff, maybe get some bad stuff. You don't really know what's in those those. Uh, those uh, cards, what's under those cards. So that's a random setup on a preset board, similar to Scythe and Clank, or similar to Clank. The similar similarity to Scythe with the, this War of Mine is that when you do go explore the town, there's really a robust system of, um, of things that you can do. And it's it, usually it's like a random deck of cards uh, at a certain location 
that you dig through or, or that you look through that maybe you draw a random one and you you act on it um and it just it has a lot of cards and i'm impressed by the sheer number of cards in this game that let you explore and i believe it's been a while since i played this war of mine but i i think there are some elements when you explore that let you dig uh pretty deep so you can you can give up something. I can't remember exactly what it is. You can give up something to dig deeper into those decks so that it's not just one random card draw and making a choice based on that. It's you're drawing a bunch of cards and maybe looking through a couple of them and choosing one. Or or you can just go deeper and deeper. I think I remember it feeling like you're walking further and further into like a hospital or further and further into a building the deeper that you dig into that deck. So that's the, uh, the, the category of, of preset boards with random elements of discovery on it. Um, what should we do next? We'll, we will do, uh, yeah, I think this is actually the last, the last category because it's a big one. No, no, I have two more. Okay. Oh yeah, this one. Okay. Um, this would be the, uh, the sea fall near and far category. I don't even know if they should be in the same group. Let's start with sea fall. They might, they might be in separate groups. So sea fall um, is a game largely about exploration. You're moving out on this board. That's the most fun I had with Seafall when I was exploring and uh, putting new stickers on this uh, on this big map that you're exploring. You're discovering islands out on this map. Um, or that's one of the elements of exploration. That's the key element of discovering these, these islands. But uh, the, the unique thing about Seafall, other than it being legacy, is that uh, while you do have a, you have a blank map, and you don't know where the the islands are going to end up on the map. So it's not quite like uh, like Clank, where you have a preset map and you know certain things are going to show up in a certain space. It's not like these other examples, really, because uh, it could end up anywhere. You don't know exactly where the island will be. And then you have this permanent island that you have discovered and that you can explore deeper through some other mechanisms in the game. Um, separate from that, I don't know if I should have included this. Should have included this in the same category, but it does have some overlap. Is near and far. Near and far is a wonderful, wonderful uh, game of largely about exploration. It has this big book of preset locations um, that you're exploring during each scenario, and at each location, you are reading about it in a book. Which actually, this has some overlap with this War of Mine because this War of Mine also has a big book of. Um, stuff that you can read, story, a big storybook. And so Near and Far has a, it, the map is preset. There's nothing random about the map. I think that actually there are a few little random elements about where you end up putting certain tokens. It's been a while since I played it. There's a little bit of random setup, but for the most part, um, Ryan Lockett has tried to tell a story about a specific part of the world using this map. So it's not a modular map. It's not shifting, it's not changing. It's a set map and you are moving around that world. And as you move to certain locations, you open up the storybook and read about what's going on there and you get to make a choice. Uh, so I, I really like this element of exploration. This is getting deeper and deeper into, I think, what my favorite element is, which is the final category. But uh, but Near and Far definitely almost falls into that category too in that it, it, is, um, it is a world that, that Ryan Lockett has designed. It is a set world. It's not random in any way. And uh, I think that adds to the meaningful choices of the game. It gives you a sense of place, that this is a real place, not a random place that you are walking around and exploring. Um, and I like the connection. I like that he, he's able to bring out these very beautiful maps with not a lot of information on them, like just enough information, while the, the heart of the story is in the storybook itself. Um, but because Ryan's the designer and the artist and partially the writer for the book, He's able to give little hints in the art at what you might find at that location, which I really, really like. All right, let's get to the uh, the final category, which is what I think is my favorite category out of all of these. Um, I, it, probably at least the most memorable category, and it involves a lot of different games, so I'll, I'll try to get through all these. And this is, um, it really does connect with Near and Far in that it, these are uh, pre-designed worlds. Someone has gone into a game and said, this is, this is either an entire world that I've designed or this is a specific part of this world that I've designed. And when you explore it, when the player explores it, you, you might choose different directions to go. But um, whenever you move like from this location to this location up here, that location will always be the same. It's not random. Um, that is a real place in this world that you are moving to. Uh, let's start with the Unlock, just because it's the smallest box. So the Unlock series definitely does this. Um, it, it gives you 
places that you like you're not r- moving into a random room when you move from one room to another and unlock or one location to another unlock gives you it, it has decided it has predetermined that uh that these are the locations in the world this is what you're moving into when you move around the world um uh pandemic legacy season two does this here we go uh and this does it uh in a cool way because you are looking down at a map and you know a few of the locations on the board when you start the game, but uh, you don't know what else you'll find throughout the board. And you get to move in any direction that you want. I, I really like that freedom of movement in exploration games where you decide, okay, we're going to go here next or we're going to go here next. We're going to look here next. Um, and Pandemic Legacy definitely, definitely does that. Um, and, and just to clarify what this category is, the opposite of za- example of this would be in, in Pandemic Legacy, if you move to a certain place and then randomly put down a location on the board based on what you discovered there. That's not the case in Pandemic Legacy Season 2. It is a, the designers have already told, decided uh, what will be in like the South American area when you, when you move to South America. Um, it's up to you to actually go there and find it and put it on the board. Um, we're getting into some of my favorites here. Uh, moving up into like my favorite games categories, really. I just played Mansions of Madness Second Edition yesterday for I think the third time, and it uh, it really has that nice sense of exploration on a micro level. Like we were moving around inside the same building for the entire game yesterday, and we start out with only one tile on the board. We don't know what else is there, but as we move around the board, we get to, we get to discover and place new rooms on the board. They're all predetermined. These aren't random. The game has told us that you need to put this specific room here, and here are these specific things that you might find in this room. Um, I really, really like that. I, I, I like that sense of space that I get, that, sp- that sense of place when I move around the board in Mansions of Madness. Uh, the final two are, um, I actually just lent my copy of The Seventh Continent out to a friend. I, at least I couldn't find it on the shelf. I'm pretty sure I lent it out. But The Seventh Continent has this element of, as well, and uh, of, of a preset world that you are exploring. The Seventh Continent adds a lot of variability to that too. Because even though you have this preset world, um, the uh, the main deck of cards you're using for your actions is randomized. So I think this is a really cool way of doing it, of having a preset world that's unknown that you're exploring as you go, but also some of the choices that you make in the game are impacted, or each, each session of the game are impacted by this random deck of cards that you go through. I think that's a really clever way of adding variability to a game, an exploration game, where you do have a preset world. And this is one of the reasons why I said um, that I think Seventh Continent does exploration potentially better than any other game on the market right now. Um, I'm kind of hoping that my my explora- exploration game will compete with Seventh, Mar- Seventh Continent in a way, but uh, but I think both will coexist as uh, as big open world exploration games. And the last, which is another exp- uh, another um, inspiration for, for my exploration game, is Time Stories. Time Stories is very much a game where you start off with very little information about um, where you're going, and you expand outwards from there. Um, time Stories, I think, does this exploration in a really unique way, because at any given time, you, you, uh, you have a grid of four cards that are usually a face-down view of where you are, and you're moving from location to location on those cards. But the game itself isn't limited to those four cards. The world of each scenario isn't limited to them. So you might explore um, a couple, you might fully explore a certain location, and then you might move on to a different part of the world. You'll wipe those four cards away and put four new cards there. And they don't like line up with the previous four cards, but it doesn't matter because those four previous four cards aren't there anymore. Um, I wish I had a, and now that I'm saying this, I wish I had a visual to explain this to you because it would make more sense. But I like that Time Stories kind of said, okay, we're going to let you focus on this area of the world and explore it as you, as you want, go in any, any order here. Um, and even as you, as you do that within those four cards, the game might say, okay, now that you've properly explored card A, replace it with a new version of card A to show that you now know other things that are there. You might have discovered like a secret room that wasn't there before when you first arrived there. Um, but then the game says, okay, you've done this. You've explored these four cards. Let's get rid of them. You can focus on something else now. So I really, really like that element of exploration in, in Time Stories as well. Plus, Time Stories takes exploration to a new level where you are you're going to these different... Uh, within each location, you have more cards. You have a, a panorama of cards that you're going to. You're picking up each one. And uh, 
if you decide to go to it and you, and you read what's on that card. Again, Time Stories is a, uh, of all these games that I just talked about, um, and kind of in, in opposition to Seventh Continent, um, Time Stories is, uh, there aren't a lot of variable elements every time you play. Like it, it is, it's a, it, you have a lot of agency in what you're doing. You're moving along any, a certain path that you have chosen. And uh, the main randomness comes from, from some dice rolling in the game. But there isn't, it really isn't a lot of randomness in Time Stories. I think that covers all the categories that I wanted to talk about today. Um, I'm not sure if this has been helpful to anyone at all, but it was helpful for me to go through and break these down into these different categories of exploration games and ranging from the completely random setups where you don't know what's out there to uh, the, these completely predefined, pre-built worlds that you are moving around in. I'm wondering if you have a preference as a player or one of these categories more appealing to you than the others. Um, or is it more that the, you have certain games in each category that you enjoy more than others? I'd love to hear your thoughts about either of those questions in the comments. Um, yeah, I feel like there, I could say more. I, I feel like there is more to say about how these, uh, how game designers can explore these different elements. But I think more of, it's more of a case where you have this wonderful toolbox of different, different exploration games and hopefully even more categories that haven't even been explored yet um, to play with. Um, my my game that I'm designing is 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 a, is a preset world, so it's it's the most like the the last category of games. But I am trying to take that element from Seventh Continent of having variable elements, so you can play. Uh, you, so each session feels feels unique whenever you play the game. Um, hopefully, I'll talk about that more in the future when the game is closer to being ready. All right, that's it. That's Sunday sit down. I'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>